right, what's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome to the launch for Ain't Burned All the Bright by Jason Reynolds with art by Jason Griffin. Uh, excited to be here tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm Randy Rebuy. I'll be moderating the conversation. Uh, I'm the author of An Infinite Number of Parallel Universes, After the Shot Drops, and most recently, uh, Patron Saints of Nothing. Uh, and I'm joined, of course, by Jason and Jason. I just want to say what's up real quick. Sometimes I think it's awkward if like the person talks too long, you don't get to say anything. No doubt, bro. Good to see you. Man. How's it going? Yeah, good to see you guys. And this is my Jason. We we haven't seen each other in real life in a long time. Uh, yeah. Jason, other Jason, this is my first time to meet you. So I'm nice excited to meet you. Hey, yeah. hey, we, hey, we appreciate you doing this for us too, bro. Thank you for, for, for hosting us. Shout out to being in. Shout out to everybody in the crowd. Uh, you know, we're just happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah, so. Uh, if you purchase the book admission for the event, just kind of get business out of the way, uh, your copies with signed book plates will be shipped out after the event. So you should expect those in eight to 10 days. All right, I'm going to do some quick intros real quick, and then we'll dive into questions. And then we're going to do uh, some time at the end for questions. And so if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box. And as questions pop up, you can upvote them by clicking on the thumbs up next to the question. Uh, to vote it up so we can see kind of which questions people are most interested in talking about. Yeah. All right. Uh, so starting out with some intros here. So Jason Reynolds is number one time New York Times bestselling author of more than a dozen books for young people, including Look Both Ways, Tale Told in Ten Blocks, uh, All American Boys, Long Way Down, Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism in You, uh, recently Stunt Boy in the Meantime, and as of this week, Ain't Burned All the Bright. He's the recipient of Newberry Honor, Prince Honor, NAACP Image Award, and multiple Coretta Scott King honors. Uh, Reynolds is also the current national ambassador for young people's literature, I think the second year in a row. Is that right? Third year. Third year. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and he lives in Washington, D.C. Jason Griffin created the artwork for My Name is Jason, Mine Too, as well as uh, Ain't Burned All the Bright. He's an artist and master collaborator who has shown his art in major cities all over the world. His most recent projects include a commissioned mural for the Children's Cancer Wing at Montfiore Hospital in the Bronx, as well as a residency at the New Contemporary Art Museum in Amsterdam, Het Hem. He currently creates in Queens, New York. All right, and I'm going to be talking to them tonight about their new book, uh, their second project together, right, their second project together, Ain't Burned All the Bright which probably has like one of the best uh, jacket copy descriptions I've ever read. I don't know if you <laughs> love that, Jason, or not, but, you know, it describes it as a uh, contemplation manifesto, fierce, vulnerable, gorgeous, terrifying, what's wrong with humans, hope-filled, hopeful, searing, eye-poppingly illustrated, tender, heartbreaking. How the heck did they come up with this project about oxygen and all of the symbolism attached to that word, especially now? Uh, yes, that's like, that's, a pretty amazing description. I don't think I can do any better, but I am wondering, like when you just run into people on the street or like in the grocery store and you're like, and you talk and you're like, Hey, I got this book out now. Like, what do you say to them when they're like, what's it about? 2020. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Hey, look, honestly, dude, like I, I feel like for, at least for me, Jay, I don't know what you say. You know, the, for me, I'm always like, yo, it's about 2020 and how, um, everything that happened in 2020 attacked the respiratory system of, of us. And that this is a book about where one might find an oxygen mask. That's what I, that, that's my elevator pitch. Geez, what'd you say? Basically the same. Yeah, basically <laughs> the same. Nailed it. <laughs> no, I mean, the interesting thing about this book is I don't think anything like this exists right now. Um, and when I, when I explain it to somebody, I'm like, well, it's not quite a graphic novel. It's not poetry being illustrated. It's not, you know, writings about paintings. It's, it's something that we've created. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid. Um, but to sum it up, it's, you know, 2020. And it's, as Jay said, it's about all the things that were kind of suffocating us in 2020 and attacking the respiratory system. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's well put, well put. You know, I, I listened to the audiobook first. And the audiobook's really interesting because there's Jason you're reading, Jason Reynolds reading one one read through, and then there's like a few different readers that kind of almost do like a choral reading, right? Of the second read through, and then there's conversation yeah. between the two of you at the end. Um, and I listened to it and I was like, this is amazing, but like how the hell am I gonna 
read this book and not look at the artwork. So I went to the bookstore and picked it up. And when I went to the bookstore, I'm like, I don't know where to find this book, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, is it going to be in poetry? Is it going to be in art? And it took me a while to find it. Uh, you know, it was, I found it eventually in just like young adult fiction, uh, which I thought was an interesting placement. But yeah, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Like I said, there's not a whole lot out there of anything like it. It's an experience. You know, I thought it was beautiful. The words are beautiful. The writing is beautiful. And it all just kind of melds together so, so wonderfully, right? Where'd you and, buy it from? You went to a capitalist? Yeah, I'm not supposed to say that here, though, right? This is the Barnes & Noble. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, but, but, hey but shout, shout out to B&M. My bad. Shout out to B&M. Hey, you know the difference between I wasn't going to say it, but. Hey, B&M, B&M got it on the table, though. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you can find it at Barnes & Noble. You know what I mean? There you go. Cleaned it up for you. <laughs> okay. you thank you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely find it. BN.com, you know, 24-7. Local Barnes & Noble bookstore. All right, all right. Anyways, so before we dig too deeply into the book, I want to talk about your relationship real quick, right? Uh, so this is your second project together. The first one, was it 15 years ago that came out? Something like that. Yeah, my name is yeah. Jason, mine too, 15 years ago. Um, so let's start, like, like, how did you meet? And then, like, why did you stay together, right? Like, why did you maintain that relationship? Because some, cer- sometimes circumstances bring us together, but what is it about the other person? Or what is it about, like... You know the friendship or the relationship that kind of kept you working together and in communication all this time so closely. Oof, big question. Yeah, we <laughs> we could go, go back. We could go twenty. We back. We could go back twenty years <laughs> if you want. <laughs> uh, I mean, what um, would you say, Jay? Yeah, tell it. Tell that. It was. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I saw Jason Reynolds. Uh, we were at a talent show at the University of Maryland. I was in the audience and Jay was performing. He's a spoken word poet. And uh, he won the talent show, killed it, destroyed it. And, you know, people are talking in the crowd. They're like, yeah, it's Jason Brown's. He's only 15, 16 years old. I said, what? At the time, I'm a freshman or sophomore. And uh, I was like, I got to meet this guy. And I saw him sitting in the dining hall and he had like a cool kind of crocheted hat on. And he reminded me, uh, like his swagger kind of reminded me of Andre 3000. And I was like, I definitely got to meet this guy. He brought the house down, he won the talent show, spoken word. So I go up to him and I'm just like, hey, I'm Jason. And uh, you seem pretty cool. I like your hat. And he was like, in true Reynolds style, he was like, yeah, I made it. I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) He was like, yeah, I know how to crochet. And I was like, all right, I need to talk to this dude. And I, I think that we talked that night for an hour and a half. Yeah. I mean, it was just like an instant connection. Um, fast forward maybe six months and then we were roommates. We were roommates in college. I brought him. I so I had seniority at University of Maryland and I was able to get the air conditioned dorm. And that was like a luxury. Hell yeah. So, I, so that was my <laughs> that was my pitch. To Reynolds, like, yo, you want to be my roommate? I can get us air conditioned. <laughs> right. I was sweltering in, in my, my dorm. It was like 300 that, degrees. That, that was really the glue of the relationship there. Hey, the air man, luxury the is AC. a more <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we, you know, we hit it off and I was an art student. He was an English major and we would just talk. We would talk about what we we're doing. He would uh, come to me. He would come with me to the art social building at like 9.30 at night and hang out while I painted. And we would just talk. And you know, it was in one of those sessions where we were just like, man, we should do something together. We should make something together. Jay, I'll let you take it from here. So fast forward, I mean, like we, we decided to make something and we're trying to give you guys the cliff notes because it's it's such a, it's a pretty in- extensive tale, our, our relationship. But basically we decided to make something and we do in college. We're still in school. We max out our credit cards. We make a, this book called Self. It's a 30,000, like calls this a $30,000 book. You got one lying around it back there with you? I was about to say. I thought you had one. So this is like old school. This is the way, this is the way, and for all the, if there's any young people watching or young artists, we did this on our own before any publishing, before any of that. This is a coffee table book that we made ourselves, right? That we had printed ourselves, right? Silk pages, the same kind of quality that Ain't All, Ain't Burn All the Bright is. We did this as 17, 19 year olds um who just went who had a dream we make this book we get out of school we move to new york and that book basically serves as our demo tape 
right? Because um, nobody would buy it. It cost 50, we were charging $50 for the book, right? So our friends are like, bro. <laughs> College students were like. $50, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we get to New York and we running around. This is before everybody had a website. This is before, this is 2005, 2006. The internet had not become what the internet is now. So there was no way for us to know how to get published. So we're running around trying to, using this book as like a, a trying to like use it as a golden ticket. We're running into publishing companies. We're jumping turnstiles. We're doing all the things that you see in the movies, um, trying to figure out how to get a publisher to take, to like see us. And of course we learned that that's not how you get published. You got to get an agent. We went through all the rigmarole. And then eventually from a fluke sort of moment, uh, we end up landing an agent. The story is just too long, but we end up landing an agent and that agent gets us a deal. And that first deal with Harper is at 21 in which we were trained in that moment. Over the course of three years, we were trained and taught narrative art, taught how to trust our guts, taught taught like plot, taught all sorts of things. And that's where my name is Jason Montu comes from. You know what I mean? And that's where that comes from. Uh, and then from there, the recession starts and no one will publish anything else that we make. So like Randy, you say like you guys have made two books. No, no, no. We've made a whole bunch of books that no one has ever seen. Right. Picture books, all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? And uh, and eventually things come back around. My career went this way. His career went this way. And uh, and then it was an opportunity for us to kind of make it happen again. And we've been friends and brothers the whole time. You know, you have your family stuff, you have your ins and outs, you got your conflict, you got the things you go through. But we've always been brothers and we've always made sure that we were able to communicate to one another um, to keep our bond. And so when it came back down to it, it was right back in a saddle, old, old, old hat. You know what I mean? We just we know each other well enough to know how this works. It's just this time we're a little more refined, a little more fine tuned and we can make something even more sophisticated. Great. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Glad you found each other. Glad you continued to work together. You know, glad you put out all these projects to kind of build towards this and who knows what else in the future, right? I was going to ask later if, you're, if you plan to put out something every few years together, but mm -hmm. we won't get it. We were getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Uh, so the, in the conversation at the end of the book, and this is kind of a little bit of spoiler, but it's not really that kind of book where spoilers really matter, right? But it's like, you talk about the process and you talk about how you were working on something else and then you were talking about kind of life in the pandemic and, and, and Jason mentioned the idea of like having like an art journal, right? Like a sketchbook or an art journal yeah. and mentioned that that was like an oxygen mask for you. And then right. Jason, you talked about how you kind of seized on that and kind of took that idea and kind of ran with it and process wise that you wrote the first section and then you, you, passed it off to Jason Griffin and told him he could do whatever he wanted with it visually, right? To kind of split it up how he wanted to split it up. So, yeah. so I'm wondering, Jason Griffin, uh, I would say just like Griffin, but it makes me feel too much like a high school football coach. Griffin's, Griffin's Reynolds. Oh, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, good. Everybody else does it. You know what I mean? All right. Yeah. So, yeah, so Griffin, uh, when you first got that first, you know, that first section, like, what, how did you even start to approach, like, what you were going to do with it visually? Like, what materials you were going to use? How are you going to format it? Like, what was going through your mind and, like, how you were going to, you know, divide that all up and what you're going to do with it? So the, the journals that you're talking about, I had started making um, in COVID as a way to kind of process uh, the world around me. We were trying, as you said, we were trying to work on this other project together. And uh, my mentor, Joanna Kotler, uh, said, you know, instead of banging your head up against the wall, because it was a tough time, you know, COVID was creatively stifling. You would, you would think that being isolated and not being able to go out, that creatives could get a ton of stuff done. Um, but, at, you know, at that time, it was just super difficult to, to focus on this project. So I had some stuff that I had made, and that's what I showed to Reynolds. So there was kind of a look and feel that was already developing naturally organically. I'm using materials that are laying around my house. I'm using tape. I'm using paint markers. You know, I'm taking some pages outside and I'm doing a little spray painting and things like that. So I already had kind of like a vibe or, you know, materials or a look that felt like it represented what we were going through. Um, and then Reynolds gave me, I can't, emphasize how brilliant this prompt was because up until this point, we had always taken an idea and he would create a piece and I would create a piece and then we would merge the two together. With this one, he gave me a breath at a time and he said, now I'm gonna give you 
it's it's about like two paragraphs or three fourths of a page, and you can break it up however you want. So for me, that was brilliant, and it was also it's it's great as an artist to have that type of license with someone's words that he would trust me like that to say, if you want to do one word on one page, and then the next three pages are blank. It's up to you. You could do a whole paragraph on one page and then the next 10 pages could be blank. So this gave me freedom to really start kind of playing with the thing. And this is how I work. I mean, it, you know, I'd love to sit here and say he gave it to me and I was like, boom, bam, just making, you know, it was, it was, I made a lot. I made a lot of things and I held things up next to each other. I'd hold a sentence up to an image. Does that feel right? Mm. Or I'd have an idea. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to draw something or I'm going to create a piece that's going to go perfect with this sentence or with this word. And it ended up working at the end or the beginning. So it was a lot of just testing things out, kind of like giving myself over to the process and really just trying to, you know, meld, meld the two things together. I, I told Reynolds, like one of the helpful things is I would just turn on Reynolds voice uh, like a YouTube interview or something like that. And I'd have his voice playing in the background and I would listen to his voice and I would read the words and I would, you know, just kind of do my thing in the studio, just putting things up on the wall, seeing if it worked. So it was, you know, it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of like having the humility to kind of stumble into certain things. Mm. And you know, the other thing that's important to note is that I know everybody is calling it a poem. It's not a poem. Um, there, it's, it's actually three it, it's really just three sentences I took out all the semicolons and the m dashes it's three run-on sentences it, it really I wrote them I mean when I gave them to Jason I gave them to Jason in prose like it, they're just straight ahead sentences it's, it's three straight ahead sentences that I removed them. before I gave them to him I removed all the punctuation uh, for the most part so that he could have the freedom to kind of move things around as need be right and break things up as need be but they're just really three sentences, like comma, you know, semicolon here, right? M dash on it, right? They're just these elongated sentences. Um, I did not want to write it in verse. It is not in verse. It looks like that because of because of his composition, because of his composition. But it but it was not written that, that way. Um, but it's just about trusting your partner and being like, hey, this is what I have for you, and you 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 make of this meal what you want. But I, but it's important to know. That's why the books the, the tag of the book is three sentences, three hundred pages. You know what I mean? Like because it's it's not it's it that's what it really was and is. Yeah. So Reynolds, when you when you started to see the imagery, the artwork that Griffin was putting together with it, I'm curious to know like, was there anything about the way he was arranging it or any of the images that surprised you or stood out to you, or kind of really you know where you just saw it and you're just like yeah he just knocked it out of the park with this page in particular. It's weird, right? Because this question comes up, Randy, and, and it's it's tough because I want to really give you like an answer that's like, man, I was so surprised, but I know this dude, right? I've been working with this guy for 20 years, right? I'm fully capable. I mean, I'm fully aware of his capabilities. You know what I mean? There's not anything that Jason has ever done that I'm like, because just because I, I we used to live together for years, we've in college and in New York and like, you know what I'm saying? And so I think I'm just sort of, like, am I always impressed? Yes. Right. Am I ever surprised? No. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I just I, I've seen him do things that uh, I, I think I honestly and I'll say this with 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 all confidence. I think he's probably the most dexterous artist that I've ever seen. The most versatile artist. Right. He he can do everything. He can do portraits. He can do <laughs> he can do illustration. He can do really, really fine stuff. He can do graffiti he can do abstract art he can I mean like the dude can do all the things um and so like I'm never I'm just sort of like bro you know what I'm saying have at it this your plate right do 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 what you want right this your plate I put the food on the plate you arrange the mm -hmm. plate however you want you make of it as you want and I think uh, this is just another situation where you you know everything we do is a trust fall and I've never let him fall. He never let me fall. And that's it. And that's what that's what this looks like. Takes Dexter. Yeah, no Dexter. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. That's cool. So, yeah, so we talked about already like the central image here of the, the oxygen mask. All right. Um, and yeah, it comes up, you know, looking the, the main character, the narrator is searching and searching, and searching for this oxygen mask. Right. And, you know, starts to realize they've been looking at it looking for it in the wrong places and then starts to realize that it's the oxygen masks 
are in all of these mundane things, right? Like the mother's smile or the crooked portrait or the brother making sound effects while he plays video games, right? Like all these different, these different images that are just pretty, pretty mundane, straightforward, right? And so, yeah, I guess that's like a two part question, but it's for both of you. So the first part is like, as you think about that, right? As you think about these mundane things, right? As, as the pandemic kind of causes us all to be kind of contained and still, uh, and you, we start to notice these things. What is it about these things that gives us oxygen? What is it about these things that give us life, that sustain us? It's a good question, man. I mean, I think that human beings in our infinite quest for adventure truly value more than anything predictability and consistency. Mm -hmm. The truth is, Randy, is you have, a, you have a young child, an infant, and that child's cry though at times can be inopportune, is a welcome sign because it is the symbol that reminds you that the child is living. Mm. What's frightening is to not hear it, mm. right? And so I think, the, so when we think about mundanity, when we think about the banality of our lives, they ground us because what they confirm is that we still hear. What they confirm is that there is normalcy, even in the midst of the most abnormal time in our lifetimes, right? It, it, they, the, the mundanity, the moments of mundanity, that's our true north. Your mother's smile, your baby's cry, the broken TV, the crumbs in the couch, the smell of, of so-and-so burning the dinner again. But like, this is what is, this, this has been our true north, whether, we, whether we've noticed it or not. And I think what Jay and I are trying to do is nudge people toward it to say like, pay attention Right. I know we said, I know we're annoyed. I know we're frustrated, but boy, doesn't a walk around the block feel different now? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, you got me, great. Jay. <laughs> yeah, you got me. <laughs> Deep. That's dope. Yeah, my uh, yeah, my child, you might be able to hear him in the background. He's reminding me he's alive right now yeah. for the last yeah. 45 minutes. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the, the other part of that question, I, I'm wondering, like, you know, you talked in the conversation at the end of the book about, you know, Jason Griffin, uh, you know, art as your oxygen mask mm -hmm. and Reynolds like writing, I imagine being like an oxygen mask for you. Right. So I don't know, this might be a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So I'm interested in your responses, but what is it about creating that gives us life? Right. In the same way we have that mundanity, what is it about creation that gives us oxygen? I think it, you know, when I think about what art is for me, and I think about the word oxygen mask, um, I think that it helps me process the world around me. You know, I think that when I'm searching too hard for answers, it's okay to get wrapped up in the questions. You know, it's okay to, to question and to put things out there and to draw or paint, to sketch, and then to see what the art tells me. You know, it's... Uh, it's having a conversation with yourself, um, you know, and it's, it's also the thing about art that I love is, is the surprise factor. You know, you can, you can think that you have something figured out. You can think that you know something and then you make something and you look at it and you analyze it. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, a happy accident. Something happens on the page that makes you kind of cock your head and look at it differently. And, and therein lies the, the answer for me. You know, it's, pre, it's pretty simple. It's, it, it helps me question my own truth again and again and again. Hmm. Oh, see, I mean, y'all give me that, these answers that are just like blowing me away, but go ahead. <laughs> but, isn't that like the, but isn't that like the beauty of what, of what like, like to be a person who create, like to be, cre to be creative, um, is to is to create right and and so like and to create something in and of its essence is to give something life right like that is what the word means right to make a thing to give a thing life right and so you know it's sort of it's sort of like a it's sort of self fulfilling in that way right it's like yo I mm. feel like I feel like things around me are dying and I have control over giving something life mm. right I have with these and this. And on all of this, right, I can make a thing come to life in the midst of a dying time. Hey, man, what a gift. 
Mm. You know, what an incredible privilege, right? And I think it's something that all of us, not just the visual artists, but any artist, right? Dancer, the writers, all of us should should take care, man, and and take heart when it comes to that. It's like, man, what a gift, Mm. you know? Even if we struggle with it, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It makes me think like, so biblically, right, the first sentence of the Bible, the Old Testament is God created. And the Hebrew word for created, if I remember correctly, is related to the word for breath. To breath. Mm-hmm. I think we, that, keep coming back to that imagery, right? It's mm-hmm. beautiful. You're getting I, deep there too. <laughs> we got the trifecta going on. <laughs> to try. I gotta try. I gotta try to keep up, or else it looks like I don't know. I love mouse up here. All right. Uh, yeah, I think like there's this whole paradox, right, between like the 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 beauty and you know the surprise and the mundane and creation that I think is very, is captured so well by just the format of the book, right? Like Mm -hmm. the the format of choosing to make it look like a journal, right? Makes you feel kind of trapped in a way, right? Trapped in these pages, but then what's Mm -hmm. on the pages, the words and the artwork just kind of takes us so far beyond and outside of the notebooks. I think it's kind of capturing that paradox. There's so many tensions, I think, happening in the same way, right? Of like being hopeless and also being hopeful, right? Being static. Mm -hmm but also finding movement and finding growth within that staticness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Writer and English teacher. I don't know if that's a word, but I'll say it. Yeah. Yeah. Staticness. Uh, yeah. So I'll, like, you know, and one of the images you keep coming back to, right. Keep each section starts with this idea of like, won't change the channel. Won't mm-hmm. change the channel. Mm. So I'm wondering like, why don't people change the channel? What keeps us watching? What keeps us stuck? Mm. You know, man, I think I think that that's a, a it's a it's a tough question. And I think it's one that we should all be asking ourselves. You know, I think it's a question you're asking the two of us, but perhaps you're asking everyone. Um, what does keep us stuck? What does keep us from turning the channel? I think I mean, look, I think that we would be it would be dismissive and disingenuous to not um, to not consider our, our, our honest and warranted fears, first and foremost. Truth of the matter is, Randy, is that 2020 and 2021 and the beginning of 2022 was frightening. Bro, it's, 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 it's strange. And I think there's a calibration that we're all trying to, to, to like make. We're trying to sort of recalibrate into whatever our new normal is, because whether we like it or not, for the time being, this is our normal, right? For the time being. And like we're trying to adjust to figure out what that means. And it's all frightening. Every day there's a new thing that we're trying to, every day we have to learn about a new thing to be afraid of. And the truth is, is that I think anxiety and, the, and, and, and fear keeps us locked, right? Because I feel like it's better to, because I, I feel like we've all been taught that like to be informed is to kill fear without ever realizing that in this particular case, to, to you know, it's, it's sort of feeding and perpetuating a certain kind of fear that we can no longer control and that sort of spins on its own axis at this point, right? The other thing though, is that, you know, I think the other part of human nature, specifically in our country, is that if it bleeds, it leads. I think we, right? It's stuff that we don't wanna talk about. We don't wanna be honest about it, right? It's like, mm-hmm. it's like we, are, we are also just as addicted to the doom, right? Mm-hmm. We are, and it's tough, right? It's tough for me to even say it, but we're, we're as addicted to the doom uh, as we are t- as to, to 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 alcohol or to any other drug, right? Like doom is also addictive. Mm. And, and what does that mean to so, to suddenly become the person who self who self flagellates? We don't look at it that way. But the truth is, is that we do. We do. We do so much that we haven't even noticed the beauty happening around us in the midst of everything else going on. I mean, look, we have precedence for this, by the way, right? Maybe in a way, not maybe not in terms of a global pandemic, but like if I'm, I'm a black person, right? Which both of you know and everybody else knows. And so because of this, this am I am thinking about my own history, my own family, and all this kind of stuff. Yo, when I asked my mom to tell me about the 60s, you know what she talks about? All the partying she did. But when I read about the 60s in the book, you know what I read about? Water hoses and dogs and marches. Mm. As if there was nothing else happening. Mm. Right? It's something to think about, right? And, and I think all of this is a part of human nature, a part of the American media, media sort of machine, a part of, a part of, and there is some truth in it as well, right? Honestly, there also, it's a scary time and it's anxious. And, you know, I think all of those things, social media, all the medias, our necessity to know every little thing about every little thing and yet know nothing about anything simultaneously, right? All of mm. that stuff, I think, is, is, is a part of where we are today, man. Um, mm-hmm. Not to sound too, too blue about it, but I do think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loop 
that at some point we're going to have to decide to disconnect ourselves from, even if just for a moment to breathe. We have to be informed. We need to take a moment to uh, to also be enlivened. Both of those things have to happen simultaneously. Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of, uh, I don't know if you've ever read this book from like the 80s by Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, I don't know, this, could, this is maybe too, too much, but just briefly, it's kind of about the changing nature of media and how the, the, con, you know, the, the form changes the substance of the form and goes into some of this a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, that media conversation is a whole other thing, Randy. We'll have to have that one offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, I got one more question for y'all, and then we're going to go into the, the audience questions. Uh, so again, just a reminder, audience, while I ask my last question, uh, you can use the Q&A box to throw your questions in there and you can look at other people's questions and give it the thumbs up to upvote the questions so we can see which ones people most want to talk about. All right. So my question is kind of a selfish one. Uh, so Reynolds, we've talked a lot over the years. We've kind of been in a lot of events. I've heard you speak so many times. And one of the thing, things that kind of comes up in a lot of your talks, a lot of times we talk, is the idea of like how our work or how we're trying to like dismantle notions of toxic masculinity through the way that we're writing, not just like the content, but also like the form itself, right? And so I'm curious to know like your take on, you know, oh yeah, and one time I heard you say everything you're doing is trying to dismantle toxic masculinity, right? Mm, mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, or, you know, Griffin, I'd be interested to hear your ideas on this too, of course, right? Especially with consideration of form, like how is this book doing that? How is this book doing that? And I, I think, and unless I'm mistaken, right? I don't know if it was an intentional choice or not, but the, the narrator is not identified by gender throughout the story, right? Right. And so, but, you know, and I would say it is still doing it, but I'm curious as to what you would say to that question. I mean, just because the narrator isn't necessarily gender doesn't mean there aren't any quote unquote men in the book, right? I mean, we, we still get to see the father, right? This is a man who's suffering. Um, and yet the way that he's interacting with the child, this child is, is really, really loving in the midst of his suffering. Right. This is this is I mean, I think of my father, God bless the dead. I think of my father who my father was who kissed me on the cheek. My father is who who lifted me up when I was sad, when I was crying. My father is who did the not my mother. It was my father who was gentle. It was my father who was sensitive. Right. And then so this father, though, he's choking and he's coughing and, and COVID is sort of ravaging his lungs. Uh, he's also trying to protect this child from the pain that he's going through and promising his child that soon he'll be back. Now look, and, and, and one could argue, and this is where, this is why, like, this is the other thing, Randy, and this is a much bigger conversation that I'm not sure we're gonna be able to have. But the other thing about the ideas around toxic masculinity is that it's rarely contextualized, right? It's rarely contextualized. So we say that there are men who, and there are men who do terrible things. And there is also a history of men who do terrible things, but depending upon the context in which those terrible things are birthed from, there's another conversation that should that needs to also be had. Not one to wipe away this conversation or to strip accountability mm-hmm. from these men, but to say like, if you are, if you a man in my family from my mother's side of the family or my father's side of the family for that matter, then like your ability to be vulnerable was a complicated thing because it could mean danger for your family. Mm. And we won't talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. And so you have it, right? We don't we don't speak about it that way. But that's a complicated nuance that should be addressed. And so in this story, you get a man who is basically trying to play macho. He's trying to like cover his his pain. He's trying to be like, no, I'm going to be okay, even though he's not quite sure he's going to be okay, right? But he's he doesn't want his 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 child to be afraid. And where I'm from, some people could argue that maybe there's a trace of toxicity in that. But I would argue. That it's, that it's the way that he knows to express love. So it isn't as black and white. It isn't as, you know what I mean? Like it, it's a little more nuanced and a little more gray and a little more muddy, which I think we should always be doing. We should be complicating all of our arguments all the time without stripping accountability from people who do terrible things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, but the other thing also is I think you look at the little brother or the, or the, or the brother, however old he is, right? And, and their relationship 
and what the brother is doing and you're addressing how first the brother is not paying attention then the brother is fighting him right but when you see the brother but when you hear about the brother in breath number one the brother is fighting for an extra life it contextualizes his behavior So it isn't just about like, you should be softer, you should be uh, empathetic, you should communicate. It's contextualizing why some of us feel a little, um, why it feels dangerous for some of us to be vulnerable. And that that part isn't always our fault. That we have to work through it and you see him work through it. You see the sister, you see the mother, everybody sort of is sort of like, yo. And eventually you realize, I mean, it all sort of sorts itself out, but the, the context is also important. And lastly, what I'll say is a lot of this sort of tearing down of toxic masculinity for this book has everything to do with its authors and not the book itself. You know, what I'm hoping that people will see is the relationship between me and my, 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 my guy here, right? Two, two men who are unafraid to tell each other how much they care for one another, how much they love one another, how much they trust one another, how much they would go to the ends of the earth to ensure the other one knew Hey, with me, you always gonna be solid. He seen me. He seen me soft. He seen me vulnerable. He seen me. He seen me go through all of the things. You know what I mean? And I'm and I'm good with standing on any stage and being like, you want to see what it looked like? This is what it looks like. This is a product of this is a product of a healthy man male relationship. This book is birthed from a healthy male relationship. That is the gift, right? Not necessarily the subject matter in the book itself, perhaps. Hmm. Took the words out of my mouth, man. I think that uh, I, I, I really um, I really appreciate you asking that question first and foremost. And I feel like three dudes talking about it is definitely a step in the right direction. And I think that's what Jay's touching on kind of in the latter half of what he's saying. And, um, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think that there have been times when we are talking about you know, the book or just life in general, um, moments where, you know, we'll come clean to each other about like, yo, where you're doing is kind of like making me feel a little this way or the other. We talk about our insecurities, our vulnerabilities. And instead of like laughing at it or instead of saying you soft, it's, it's a thank you. It's welcomed. Like, I appreciate you telling me that. I remember one time I, I told Reynolds something like that. You know, I said, forget what it was, but I was, I, you know, I'm in a state of vulnerability, telling him how I feel about something, talking about my feelings, one man talking to another man about his feelings. And Jay was like, I really appreciate you telling me that. I'm going to be mindful of that in the future. And I remember, I'll never forget, in, in the middle of that conversation, he was like, you know, we're lucky. We're lucky that we can talk about these things. I don't think a lot of dudes can talk about these things with each other. And I think that's, he's absolutely right. If there's one thing that stood out to me, it's that we're, we're trying to do that with our, our art respectively. You know, we're showing you that we're empathetic towards each other. We're taking a central theme and we're, we're vibing off each other. The parts that hurt, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make art that makes it feel like pain. There's a lot of feeling that went into this book, mm-hmm. you know? How do you how do you how do you illustrate or how do you make art about heartache or worry or panic or wanting to get someone's attention, feeling left out, feeling overlooked? Like those are we're talking about feelings right now, and I think that that's you, this. Let's bring it full circle. This being the last question, you know, you say what's the glue? that's kept you guys together over 20 years. It wasn't the AC. <laughs> it wasn't the air condition. It's, this, air. it's this right here. Yeah. yeah. We've always been able to kind of talk about these things with each other. Yeah, I talked to him once a week on the phone, bro. And the very first thing we talk about in every phone conversation is what, what both of us are talking about in therapy. Every single time we're on the phone, he's like, yo, I was talking to my therapist, man. I'm like, oh, man, my therapist said, yeah. Like, that's what it is, bro. Right. We're trying to fix each. I'm trying to, bro, I'm trying to heal both of us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's what it is, man. We want to represent that. That's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful and well said. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to add to that. I feel like we could talk about that for like another hour mm-hmm. or two, right? But, but we should we'll leave it there. One I'll day. let your words, yeah, I'll let your words stand. Uh, you might hear my son screaming in the background. He, he wants to give his input as well. Uh, but we're moving to some questions here from the audience. 
Uh, so thank you all those people putting in questions. Let's go with, uh, this one is for Jason. How are you able to silence the other works that you're writing to focus on the one you are working on currently? Because we all know you have like a thousand books come out each year. Yeah, you guys got to remember that we're both named Jason. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if I was like, I'll take this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, how do I do it? You know, it's just, I just organize it. I just organize it up here. It's like, look, I can only do one thing at a time. So I sit down and I look at what's in front of me and I, and I focus all of my energy on the thing that's in front of me. And when that thing is done, I move on to the next. The beauty of me, of my life, and, and even working with Jason for so long, who taught me, because Jason taught me a certain kind of rigor earlier. I mean, when we were in our, when I was in my early 20s and late teens. And I think the one thing is that, like, I've never been afraid of hard work. And I'm fortunate enough to have a brain that still sort of moves at a certain clip where I can kind of turn one thing off and turn another thing on. And, and it's like walking from one room into the next, right? All the furniture is where it needs to be when I click the light switch. Right. And that's it. And I get to it. So I'm, I'm fortunate for that. That would be nice. That would be nice. Uh, <laughs> all right. This is probably hopefully just a quick one. Uh, the question is, are there plans to reprint? Uh, you know, my name is Jason. Mine, too. Yeah, yes, be there out are. a few months. <laughs> be out in a few months. A few months. All right. So yeah, that was a quick one. Great. <laughs> Uh, let's see, moving right along. Also a quick one, hopefully. Uh, what's the lowest age you would recommend this to? This is from a middle school librarian and a uh, long way down ghosts or top checkouts. Mm. I, I, me personally, I can never put no age limit on nothing like this. You know what I mean? It's zero to 99. You, you know, if you got, especially if there's somebody there, I mean, let them fool. Them. Here's the thing. If a kid doesn't necessarily, it can't necessarily grapple with all the language, they gonna love the art, let them get lost. You know, that was always our goal. That was always what we wanted. It's like, there, this, it operates on multiple levels and multiple layers. So if you were young, a youngin and you may not understand what's happening in the text or, or catch all the references, but get lost in the beauty of the book, right? And come back to it in, in two years and it'll read a little differently to you, you know? Mm -hmm. Great, uh, this question is from Shahala Middle School. For both of you, uh, who or what first you got first got you into reading when you were kids, or were you into reading? I was. I loved fun facts. I was all about fun facts. So I was like, <laughs> I was the I was the kid with like the Guinness Bro with the records. That was that was my jam. Just so I could you know spout off some random stuff at school. <laughs> he was that dude, the trivia man. <laughs> And for me, yeah, I struggled with reading, man. That wasn't really my thing. Um, but I love reading now. I found my way, you know, but but I, I had a hard time. As most people know my story, I didn't really get to the books until a little later. And to tack on a little bit more to this, uh, Griffin, what got you into art initially? Mm. Well, it's always, it's always been a way that I, I processed. Um, you know, I've been drawn since my parents can remember that's how far like I don't even remember but my parents will tell me like my mom said when you were three years old you drew train tracks going this way instead of like this way so there was already perspective and my pops my dad said uh he realized when I that I was an artist when uh my mom's friend had passed from AIDS and I was trying to process it I was in elementary school and I, I drew a picture late at night of heaven, my idea of heaven, and that helped me sleep at night. So, I mean, it's, it's in me, man. It's my oxygen, man. It's, I need it. It's my breath, you know? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, Paul. Uh, all right, next question. Certainly one of the times, also connected to what you were just saying. Uh, my colleagues and I just had to fight a book challenge. Mm. How do we find the oxygen during this? Stamped was one. It was hard to dig ourselves out of the despair when people are attacking. Yeah, you know, I, I tell people the truth. Every time this question comes up, I try to be honest about it. And my honest answer is, I don't know. 
I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out like everybody else. You know, I'm challenged. The, the books, my books get challenged all the time, as all of you know. Um, I don't know. A- extracurricular, right? Like book clubs and 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 figuring out ways to, if you can't teach the book, to keep the book in the classroom. You know, I remember being a kid, a young kid, and I wanted to learn about Buddhism, but I went to a Catholic school. <laughs> and, but I had a teacher, my buddy, Mr. Williams, who kept the books in his classroom. Mm. And that way I could get my hands on them, right? Accessibility, unless you have a school that's like, they can't be in the school, right? Which I know that's happening too. But if it's a situation where they say you can't teach it, okay, then you can't teach it, but you can keep it in the class. You can have it, make it accessible for the youngest who might want to read it. And I think that's one thing we can do and create space for dialogue and discourse with those young people. I know y'all have enough on your plate, but if you can carve out just 21 minutes of the day, which I know is tough to have a little discourse, a little unpacking with that kid or those kids, um, that there might be some oxygen there, you know, but that's, I'm, I'm careful about this because I don't really know everybody's situation. It's a tricky one. And I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer, but I try to be honest about the fact that it's, it's complicated. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll also shout out like the, the ALA as like the Office of Intellectual Freedom, yeah. right? Which kind of has a toolkit and like has guidance for how to respond if you do have a book challenge at your school. Yeah, absolutely. I keep forgetting you're a teacher, Randy. You know all this <laughs> stuff. Hey, Randy, answer these questions, bro. Like, you know these stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's too hard. They're too hard. I'll leave you. Me too, man. <laughs> uh, all right. This one, next one from Caitlin. Uh, Did you have a process for helping you identify the mundane things in your life? I would love to get my students into appreciating these little moments. So basically, how do you I looked around my house. Like I really just sat on the couch or sat, and I went to see my mother too at one point. And I sat on my mother's couch, sat on my mom's kitchen table, the same table that I grew up eating at every single day. And you look around and everything is exactly as it was when I was a child, right? Like, and I'm looking around and I'm like, yo, the picture, the this, the that, everything, right? And I'm, re- re- and I'm envisioning my brother and I, I'm envisioning my sister, I'm envisioning, you know, the television that my mother still to this day, if you go to my house right now, it's seven o'clock at night, the news is on right now. It's been on since three o'clock, right? Like on a loop. You know what I mean? It's like a real thing that she is like, she, and she's like, I know I got to cut it off, but I just can't, I just can't addict it to, it's wild. Um, and so I think I, you know, I looked around at all the things that I grew up with, you know, the small things, the leftovers in the refrigerator, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like just stuff that we all can relate to. All right, next question. Uh, I'm gonna ask this one. Come. One for Griffin and then come back to, uh, to Reynolds. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Last two images, last eight words stopped me in my tracks. My breath caught in my chest and made me cry. It cut to the very essence of life. My question to Jason Griffin, how did you decide what the perfect two images would be to illustrate this? Whew, that is a great question. That is a great question. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming these are, this is like the fallen tree and then the, the, the plant growing. And uh, that was actually a tree that, that had been knocked over by one of the storms at the park that I go to with my kids. And, you know, throughout COVID, as Jay said, you know, also doing therapy remotely. And we're talking about kind of what it is to, how do you rebuild yourself? How do you reprogram? How do you grow? And we talk about, and, and there's a lot of imagery of a, of a house in the book. And the idea that, that we all kind of are these vessels, these houses, um, and that in order to build up, sometimes you need to clear the whole house and then you need to dig down deep. And you need to clear out all the foundation so that you can lay foundation for a bigger house. And I think that it kind of, it, it, it vibes with that, this idea that you have to clear something out, you have to make room, you have to, in essence, kill a part of yourself in order to make space for new things, um, in order to reprogram, in order to to grow. Hmm. I got scared when you said kill because you paused and I was like, kill people? And my mind, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, 
Yo, I, was like, I, scared, oh, I scared myself a little bit. I was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, this thing took a turn for the worst. I was like, <laughs> 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 glad he glad he yeah. finished the thought. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Yeah, no problem, yeah. bro. <laughs> that was a close one. <laughs> I was about to be like, when he says kill, he means figuratively. <laughs> I saw Jay like this. He was like, <laughs> I was like, it's got it's got dark real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Am, am I to talk about the last few pages of the book? Am I the words on the last few pages of the book? Is that what you asked? If not, it's okay. I, I wasn't sure. Uh, I think it was specifically for Griffin, so you can, you can chill on that. One. I didn't want to spoil. <laughs> good because I didn't want to spoil my thoughts about yeah. those last words. I think they should be thought about. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. All right, by time for a couple more questions here. Uh, I'm just kind of going by like the most upvoted ones. Uh, so, all right. So this is from Lindsay. How can I bring some of the topics you address in this book into a writing-centered English classroom? Oh, I think this book is the this is the lob of all lobs. If you, if you <laughs> this is it, I, I feel like we give it the alley oop. <laughs> like, like, like I feel like this is the alley oop. If you are a writing teacher, the book is full of prompts. Basically, it's a book of prompts. You know what I mean? Like. You can use, I mean, there are so many motifs here. So for you to unpack and fool around with, you can think about the television and all the things one might see on a television or what it might mean to change the channel of one's life, right? You can think about uh, uh, siblinghood and what does it mean to, to, to have siblings, even if those siblings aren't blood, right? You can use your best friends and so forth and so on. Um, what does it mean to be distracted? What does it mean, um, like all of the language about, you know, uh, have you ever known someone with a trumpet in their throat or, or what other instruments might be in a person's throat at any given time? And if a person and if a person is a kind person, what instrument is in their throat? If a person is an angry person, what instrument is in their throat? Right. There, there's so many. I mean, I could do this all night. You know what I mean? So I, I really just I really encourage people, especially people who have a writing centered English class. Like, yo, break the book down and really do close reading and pull apart some of the metaphors and some of the some of the sort of. Um, you know, some of the figurative language to build to build prompts uh, for your students. I think there's a whole lot here to deal with. Um, and you can attach you can attach the issues of the world to these prompts very, very easily. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the let's see. This one. OK, yeah, so some of the, so I'm reading through some of these. Some of these are kind of similar to ones we've already talked about, so I'm going to I'll skip some of them, uh, but they're all great questions. So people putting questions in, and I always feel bad when we don't have time to get to all of them, right? When I teach my classes, I always always talk about how there's always always more to say, always more questions. I never have time for for all of them. Uh, I'm going to go with one of the questions that this is selfishly one of my interests as well. Um, have you considered working together on a kids' picture book? <laughs> we tried. <laughs> We, we, we've done it a few times before although before before i had kids before i had kids we tried man hey mm-hmm. look hey, hey this is the truth about jason and him we want to talk about jason don't jason don't really like drawing the same thing over and over again so it becomes <laughs> so, so it becomes difficult i would love i would love to do a picture book with it. i would love to do a picture book with jason but jason don't like drawing the same thing over and over again I got to feel it, man. I got to feel it. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. <laughs> yeah, all right. There you have it. I think we're all still waiting, though. We're all still hoping that you'll, 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 you'll land on it. You'll make it happen some days. Hey, talk to your man. I'm good. With my, I'm ready. Talk <laughs> to your guy. And now, you know, now I have a 17 This has got to be like a book of tangents, you know, like <laughs> a, scat, a scatterbrain. <laughs> You know, the, the, the character's got to be just like all over the place. Yeah, I would read it. I would read it. Yeah. <laughs> dream state. Everything got to be a dream state. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right. Yeah. Keep an eye on the time. We are out of time. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your attention, your questions, your presence. Uh, you know, thank you to, to Jason and Jason for joining the conversation, kind of having the space for us. Thank you for Barnes and Noble for creating that space. Uh, you know, just as a quick reminder, if you if you purchase the book through the ticket, that'll be shipped out after the event. You get it eight to ten days. Buy a copy for yourself. 
everyone you know. It is beautiful. It's heavy. I read it in the bathtub. That's a little dangerous. That's a little risky because it's really heavy. <laughs> but it's still enjoyable. Um, I love the book. Everybody should read it, teach it, and use it. Yeah. And yeah, and just a reminder, buy that book, their other book, uh, Jason's other books, my books at bn.com, whenever, and also at your local Barnes & Noble stores. All right. Uh, yeah, so thanks for joining everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a good night. Peace out. Peace, peace.